Uh, we have a few announcements. The church board meets after worship today, June 18th. I know that's a ways away. Put it on your calendars. I knew better than to schedule anything for farming community in May. But we will meet with the representative from the Christian Church Foundation to discuss potential endowment funds. Uh, are there any other announcements this morning? I uh, hear we have a birthday, though. Diana's birthday is Saturday. <laughs> Exactly with the 
sun, and it's called an eclipse. So it will, the moon, even though it's smaller, will block out the light from the sun. And it will get dark during the day. And what? And the bats will come out. So what are these? No, these are sunglasses, right? And what do we put them on for? Why do we wear sunglasses? Get the sun away from our eyes. But you know what? On this special day, we have these special glasses. And these glasses are called eclipse glasses. Can you pass them out? Can you give one to Ellie? Amelia? So put them on. I think it keeps it dark. Very, very dark, isn't it? Now these are the only glasses that you can use to look at an eclipse. Yes, you can only see a little light when you look at it. And that is because if you look directly at the sun right now, what would you do? You'd blink and look away because it would hurt, right? But when the moon is blocking the sun, those rays are still coming. So to see the eclipse, you have to wear these glasses. But it's very, very dark. So what does this tell you about when it's dark? So when it gets dark, what do you think will happen? What do you think will happen? Is it going to stay dark forever? No. The moon's going to move. And the sun will come back out. Have you ever had a day where you think it was kind of dark? Kind of sad? Things didn't go on? Those are considered dark days. Do they last? No. No, and why don't they last? Because it's always going to be better later, right? And how can we make it better later? Karen, how can we make it better? What? How can we make the day better? We talked about it downstairs. If we're mad and we're upset, what do we do? We calm down, we take a deep breath, and we say thank you, right? We have to say thank you for everything that we're getting, right? All right, so remember tomorrow, when your adults tell you, you make sure you wear these glasses and you can take these home, okay? Yeah, I'm going to watch them at school. You're going to watch them at your school? All right. going to have like really Yeah, it's going to have glasses. All right, who loves you?
you will call to me, and I come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nation, nations and places where I banish you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. And from the Gospel of Luke, this takes place on the afternoon of the resurrection. Two guys, Cleopas, we're told is the name of one, and another person, are walking toward Emmaus. We don't know what Emmaus is, it's not on the map, but they're walking there. And as they do so, the resurrected Jesus appears to them, only they don't recognize him. They have some conversation about what has happened, they talk about scripture, Jesus provides some teaching on that scripture, and it's getting late in the day, and we pick up the story here. They came near the village where they were going, and he gave the impression, Jesus did, that he was going further. But they urged him, stay with us, because it's almost evening, and now the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. It was as he reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. It was a very tense political climate. A couple of friends were backing a guy that they thought would bring about much needed change and liberate them from an oppressive government. Most of the people they knew did not like the government and would be happy to see it overthrown. And there were a lot of groups that were gathering together, preparing for such an opportunity. There were, they were arming and training themselves, waiting for the moment when they would strike. They just needed the right leader. They thought they had found their guy and were ready to strike at his command, overthrow the existing government, and reinstate a proper one with this guy at the helm. There is an electricity in the air that the time was near. The group of zealots, the many groups of zealots, were energized and ready, just waiting for the signal to rise up. Politics dominated almost every conversation, and people were passionate about their beliefs. In a shocking turn of events, their guy wasn't the guy. In fact, he was defeated soundly. Not only that, but he was gone. Time to move on, continuing with the oppressive government running things. Obviously, I am speaking about the events surrounding Jesus' death. It was a highly charged political situation. In the Roman Empire, crucifixion was highly political, and the Jews in and around Jerusalem had been waiting centuries, countless generations, for the leader who was to come and redeem them from the Romans, and they just knew Jesus was their God. There was a heightened energy among them, and they were ready to follow him anywhere. If he just gave a sign, any sign at all, they were ready. They would rise up, and they would follow him wherever he led. Only it didn't happen. Not only was he defeated, he was crucified. And you don't come back from that, right? In our passage today, it is a bit absurd that Cleopas and his friend cannot recognize the man that they thought was the Messiah just three days ago. 
The text actually says that they didn't recognize him. They couldn't tell you that that was Jesus right there in front of them. And what kept them from doing that? We don't know. But what if they cannot see Jesus in part because they think they already understand what is going on? Here's why I say this. Jesus shows up to them and asks them what they are discussing. Cleopas responds, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem that does not know what happened? We can't know his tone, but I imagine it has some disdain or a little bit of sarcasm in it. Are you clueless? How can you not know? Do you live in a cave? So they go on to tell Jesus what happened to Jesus over the last three days in Jerusalem. What if the disciples cannot recognize Jesus because their opinions are already fully formed? Like all humans, their assumptions shape what they talk about, and what they talk about shapes what they see. For instance, if I tell you that somebody is going to come running through the front doors and steal those lanterns from the communion table and somebody comes running in here, we're going to have assumptions about what we see. But Cleopas assumes that Jesus is a stranger in front of them and is clueless. And second, that his cluelessness makes him a stranger, and not just a stranger, but an outsider. One who does not belong. Our assumptions matter. My dad, you know, I came along a little later in life after my brothers, and my dad wanted to ensure that I could be independent. He made sure I could change the oil in a car. He made sure I could change a tire in my car. He made sure I could do a lot of things. And in particular, he made sure that I could discern when people's words were not in alignment with their intentions. He did that by teaching me to play poker. From a very young age, I learned how to watch people and to see if they were speaking the truth and if their actions followed. True story, my first day of kindergarten, before he took me to school, my dad sat me on his lap and he said, now listen, honey, when you get to school, you count one, two, three like the other kids, not ace, deuce, three. All right, fair enough. I could count to 21 and I could add and subtract anything 21 or less. Anyway. That was an important lesson, and it saw me through some difficult spots. When I was in the National Guard, I was the only woman in my unit, and that skill was a very good skill to have. Time and time again, I had to educate men that I served with that what they assumed was not always true. After I'd been in about six or seven years, we were beginning to transition from Huey helicopters to Blackhawk helicopters, and I was sent out to Pennsylvania for a month, one month transition school. No need to start and do the whole thing over again once you had competency on a helicopter, you just need to translate that into the systems of a new type of helicopter. So I was out there for a month. It was payday, Friday afternoon, we were all flush with cash. I was bored, so I went down from the barracks into the common room to get a soda or something out the vending machine, see if anybody was watching TV. The guys there were playing poker, and there were four of them. It seemed like that somebody had lost big and left, and these four were sitting around. Well, they huddled together. And then one of them invited me to join them. Sure, why not? So I sat down at the table, but then they started explaining to me how poker worked. Okay. I've taught this lesson many times about assuming things because of my gender. I would 
teach it again, only this time it was going to cost them. Cost them several hundred dollars. But they learned that lesson again. Our assumptions matter. And what we talk about comes from our assumptions. What we pay attention to forms our beliefs, our expectations, and our assumptions. And the stories we tell confirm certain beliefs that we uphold. How many people, by a raise of hands, by a show of hands, how many of you enjoy fired up political conversations with people that believe differently than you do? Especially if it's with family and friends. Exactly. We tend to avoid them. What we do prefer is discussions of those nature among people that have the same beliefs that we do. And we end up in an echo chamber where we just hear the knowledge and the beliefs that we already have reflected back to us. That's also how social media works. Whatever you click on, you get more of. So, all of our biases, all of our assumptions get confirmed when we do this. And I know that I do this. I would imagine you do this. It's not often that we question our assumptions. We generally reinforce them. And the danger of that, of course, is that like Cleopas and his companion, our bias and our limitations can give us tunnel vision, and we may miss Jesus altogether, even when he is standing right in front of us. And maybe not only do we miss Jesus, but everything he embodies. Hope, new life, the promise that suffering and death never happen at the end of the story. And the disciples explain to Jesus, they explain Jesus to Jesus that he had just died on the cross. And Cleopas says, and I love this one, some of the women shocked us by saying his tomb was empty and the others went and verified their story but didn't see him. <laughs> Another assumption. But Cleopas assures, assumes that the women and the disciples who proclaimed that Jesus had risen were wrong because they could not verify it for themselves. The story just drips with irony. And Cleopas falls into a trap that so many do with Jesus. When he talks to them, teaches them, when he uses parables, often the one that is the smart guy at the end of the parable, ends up realizing the foolishness of himself, of himself. So Jesus' question, what are you discussing, invites us, too, to pause and pay attention to the stories that we are telling, to the assumptions that we hold, and to the fact that what we discuss shapes what we see and cannot see. Do the things we discuss amongst ourselves lead us toward Jesus? Do they lead us toward wholeness? Do they lead us toward hope, away from bitterness? Or do they lead us to spiritual blindness where we are unable to see Jesus even when he is standing right in front of us? To what and to whom we are not paying attention, and to those we neglect through our ignorance or devalue them because they are somehow outsiders or different, shapes our journey. When we paint people and groups of people with a broad brush and think that we know all there is to know about them or anyone like them, we become a clear and present danger to ourselves and our souls, effectively shutting out the movement of the Spirit 
within us. But that's not the end of the story. Today begins a sermon series on the beauty of the earth, and today we look at the beauty of hope. And there are three things about hope. First, it is around us. The two friends were getting on with their lives, and that's what we do after tragedy or any other events in life. We get on with our lives. They were moving on to what was next for them, and in doing so, Jesus appeared to them. And he encountered them in a way that they didn't expect or even realize at the time. Hope is around us. Hope shows up. And it's not always in a way that we expect, but it does appear. Hope is persistent. When we take the time to prune our spirits, when we take the time to call out our willful ignorance or our unwillingness to move forward after a heartbreak, that's hard to do. But when we do those things, hope is persistent. It continues to appear. It continues to surround us. It continues to confront us. And the third thing about hope is it is available. There's always something to grasp. There's a line in a Star Trek episode or movie, and I can't tell you the context or the character, but this person said, there's no such thing as false hope, it's just hope. And it may look different than we expect, but it is available to us in any situation. I don't believe Je the disciples saw Jesus' crucifixion as a sign of hope. I think they saw the crucifixion as the opposite of hope. And yet, any time God gets involved, whatever is the worst of the story is never the end of the story. There's always something in the moment. And if you can't find it, if you can't experience it, look up. Look up to the beauty of the night sky and the gazillion shot stars shining down. Look up to the way the light provides life and warmth. Look up to see how the clouds move through the sky and how the rays of sun will break through. Look up and gain a new perspective. Hope is available. And it grows within us. It gives us the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the hearts to embrace what is right in front of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shall we sing? Please stand as you're able.
joys and concerns in our community and in our world. Would anyone like to share how you've been blessed this week? We also have concerns. Are there any concerns to be shared this morning? Let us pray. Holy God, help us to make space for you in every portion of our lives, even and especially in the ordinary, everyday moments. Help us to find room for your love and your presence in our places of work, in our homes, in our schools, and most importantly, in all those places we try to hide from you. We know that you are chasing after us, you pursue us, you show up to us, and we ask to be wise enough, brave enough, and faithful enough to let you in. Oh God, we know that you forgive us for the things that we do or left undone, for the things that we say or left unsaid. And we give you thanks for your forgiveness. And as we are forgiven, may we also forgive others. And God, we pray for those throughout this world who are living out the worst moments of their story. For those who live each day in violence, disaster, war, and destruction. For them we pray. For those who seek the basic needs of life, of food, shelter, clothing, clean water, and the love of family and friends, for them we pray. And for those among us who need healing in their bodies, minds, and spirits, hear us now, O oh God, as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask these things as an Easter people, in the name of the one who was raised, that we might have eternal life. Amen. From our hearts, let us give back to God what God has graciously given to us. Jesus' name we pray. 
regarding the scripture, and then they shared the sacraments. As they went through that activity on a Sunday afternoon of hearing the scripture, of the proclamation of the scripture, and sharing of the bread and the wine, they realized Jesus had been present with them the whole time. As do we, when we come to the table together, we realize that Jesus, too, has been present with us the entire time. Let us come forward today and share in the gifts of God for the people of God.
And on the night when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and shared it with them, and said, This is the new covenant poured out for all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Shall we pray? Lord, as we come into your holy presence, hear our prayer for all those who have great needs. Send us from this worship strengthened and ready for real living, so that we are no longer afraid of life. Grant us power to overcome and faith to rise above life's disappointments and tragedies. Help us to be still and know that you are God. Deepen our spiritual lives and help us to grow closer to you. Bless this loaf and cup as we remember the supreme sacrifice that was made so that we may live with you in eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.